Well, we are surveying the book of Psalms, and we're going to explore Psalm 61 through 68 this evening. Many of them are rather short ones, uh, but uh, still we will jump right in. Psalms, of course, are, we're really paging through a hymnal, a, a, a Israel's hymnal. And uh, it's, it consists of poetry, which is laced with strong theology, some astonishing issues that lurk beneath the phrases. Uh, but it is primarily praise. The Hebrew term for the book means praises. And 55 of these are addressed to the musician. They're intended to be sung. Unfortunately, we've lost that music. We, we don't know how they sounded in that sense. But it's the concepts and the issues that we want to get into. In the Greek, they, see, they speak of psalmoi, a poem to be sung as a, on a stringed instrument, or a saltar, which is a harp or stringed instrument. From those Greek terms, we get the term that we call them psalms. That's an English term. And there are about 150 of them, 73 specifically ascribed to David, and uh, 12 to Asaph and 12 of the sons of Korah, both were songsters, if you will, and a couple of Solomon and a handful of others, including one from, by Moses. There are 48 anonymous ones, many of which, though, scholars still uh, ascribe to David anyway because of his style and other things. But in any case, that's what we're skimming through. And it's interesting that the book of Psalms is actually five books. If you, took, if you separate those five into their constituent parts, you really have a Bible of 70, not 66 books, but let's not cause confusion on that point. These five collections have been labeled by a number of scholars the same way the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, are labeled. They have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy of the five books of Psalms. And uh, there's various ways to try to rationalize this that I could go through, but I have to tell you candidly, I'm not overwhelmed by the clarity of that categorization. What we do know, there are five books because each one ends with a special benediction. So the partitioning obviously has some, some literary roots. But uh, I personally am not going to make too much of the, the packaging of these by some commentators. We're just going to look, we'll just go through them. And we, of course, are in the second of those five books. Book two, as they would call it, sometimes called the Exodus portion of the Psalms. And uh, now, as we approach this particular kind of literature, let's stand back and think a little bit about how we want to approach it. Uh, historical passages or prophetic passages, we try to get in and, and get the expositions of them. But this is really a devotional exercise that we're engaging in. And so first of all, we look at it from its past. Many of them are specifically labeled as to David's predicament that led to the psalm, what his motives were in writing it, and so forth. And that's useful where we can infer it correctly. But what we're really interested in more is how does this impact Israel today? These are Israel's hymns. How do they impact Israel today? That's the present tense sense of them. But what most of us are really interested in is how does it affect us personally? How does it impact you today? And I'm going to suggest to you that if, you ha if you're not in or haven't been in the real depths of terror, despair, anxiety, then you can speak about the Psalms only as the blind speak of color. That what they're all about is deep, deep um, issues of the heart. And so we need to understand that. That's the personal side. That's the important side for most of us. But there's another dimension of the Psalms that uh, people are somewhat familiar with, and that's the prophetic nature of them, especially that subgroup that are called Messianic Psalms. They describe Jesus Christ in some astonishing ways. In fact, the, uh, the ones that we call Messianic are those that, are that not only speak of Christ, but are quoted as such in the New Testament. There are a few other Psalms that are not so quoted in the New Testament that I suspect also are Messianic. We'll touch on those as we go. But there's yet another prophetic category beside messianic that we might be aware of, and that's dispensational. Some of these psalms would seem to portray certain segments of time in God's eschatological profile, from, from the, the somewhere between the creation and the establishment of the kingdom. We have a number of specific periods of time uh, portrayed in the prophetic scriptures, many of these psalms would seem to amplify uh, those, uh, those uh, dispensations or segments of dispensations um, appropriately. So those are 
Uh, and that, that's speculative, but uh, I'll leave that to your own judgment to see how you feel about those things. But past, present, personal, and prophetic are the four, at least four, different ways we can view or approach the Psalms. But I want to highlight what my, uh, really is a caveat. Uh, the, the, the animals that were suitable for clean sacrifice, the clean animals for sacrifices, were those that chewed the cud. And I think there is a deliberate intention for us to understand that we should be doing the same thing, chewing the cud. The prophet says, thy words were found and I did eat them. And Jesus in John 6 makes it, has the uh, eat my flesh and drink my blood in a, in a metaphorical sense, of course. Um, and John in Revelation, same thing. He takes the little book and, and eats it in chapter 10. These are, these are idioms that are very deliberate, very profound. We want to avoid analysis paralysis. We'll talk about some background and so forth, but it's very... We're going to try to minimize the peripheral aspects of this. Because that can blindfold your souls to the real message. To get caught up in some of the technical or historical details. We're interested in prayerful absorption. Not intellectual dissection. This is not a doctrinal uh, excursion. It's a devotional excursion that we're involved in. And the main thing we're going to try to achieve is a gateway to his presence. That's really what we're all about. That's what we want to try to accomplish with all of this. So, okay, let's just jump in with Psalm 61. And uh, like many of these psalms, David was in danger. Clearly, he was apprehensive. He had issues. It's, many scholars believe that Psalm 61 is, is one of those that he penned while uh, facing the rebellion of his son uh, Ab, uh, Absalom. Absalom had led quite a revolt, a very widespread thing in 2 Samuel 15 through 18. And um, uh, 4 chapter 15, 16, 17, 18 deal with this widespread rebellion that figures so prominently in many of the Psalms. And this is not just a personal issue with David. This is his, his uh, throne itself was in danger, as will become clear as we get into this. So, so this is to the chief musician on a negana, which is a stringed instrument, probably not distant from our guitar kind of sounding, if you will. Psalm of David. He opens up, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. His first opening line is a cry to God. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Now there's a familiar phrase in our ears, isn't it? Who is that rock? That's not, you're right, it's Jesus. It's not just a speculation. Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. He speaks of the rock that followed him through the wilderness wanderings. The one that was struck for the water and so forth. It was, a, it was idiomatically, a, Christ is our rock. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That's David's plea. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Is he a shelter for you? Is he a strong tower? You know, those are very comfortable poetic phrases. Is he really? He has been for me. And I hope you discover that too. David says, I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of your wings. Selah. Now, the word trust there, or make my refuge in the covert of your wings. And um, the wings. Under his wings we shall trust, according to Psalm 91. We'll get there later. Um, in Matthew 23, Jesus one of the great tragedies of history is I would have gathered thee as a hen gathers chicks, but you would not. And uh, David says, I will trust in the covert wings. He says, I will abide in the tabern in thy tabernacle. That's a strange phrase. He was a king. He could not go in the tabernacle. He had to be a Levite to go in the tabernacle. He's speaking idiomatically here. Obviously, he understood the tabernacle. He'd studied the scriptures. He knew what was in there. And he can emotionally abide in that in the sense of relying on it without physically going in there. He couldn't do that as a king. Uh, it's, a, it's forbidden. He continues, for thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Boy, that's a precious thing. That's a precious thing. I, in, in, in relatively recent years, have come to really value the heritage 
that you and I enjoy. We live in the most interesting political experiment on the, in the history of the planet Earth. You, if you, you, you read about our founding fathers, those were geniuses. They were passing out pamphlets, the Federalist Papers, they're passing out pamphlets on the street corners that today are reading at the college level. <laughs> It's astonishing to see the way they express themselves. It's astonishing to realize how they put God ahead of all their, in their thinking. And um, Newt Gingrich has just done a book called uh, Rediscovering God in America. And it's basically just a recounting of how the God of the Bible is everywhere in Washington, whether they like it or not. <laughs> and uh, the heritage we have, you know, um, we have highly organized groups of people trying to separate us from that heritage. We use the term liberal. It's not, that's not a descriptive term. They're not liberal at all. They, they, they don't, they, uh, they're not tolerant. They're only tolerant if you agree with them. So liberal is not a descriptive term. You know, the homosexuals have pawned off this term gay. Well, I'm gay. You know, they, they like to say that as if there's nothing gay about that lifestyle. It's life shortening. But they've been able to, you know, play with that vocabulary. We don't. We fall in the same trap. We call them liberals. No, they're they're subversives. They're trying to separate us from our heritage. They're welcome to live here. Welcome to do whatever they like, but not separate us from our heritage. And uh, you see it everywhere. I just got back from my 53 year of the Naval Academy, and it's astonishing what they've done to West Point, Annapolis, thrown away 150 years of tradition. It's a wonderfully uh, facilitated place. But it's, it's something very fundamental, fundamentally lost that's going to come home to roost. Here David says, Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Boy, have you ever thought about how grateful we should be for the heritage that we enjoy that has been brought to us at such a high price? It's interesting that the military cemeteries are filled with patriots who died fighting everything that the so-called liberals stand for. But it is what it is, and God is in control, so we stand back and watch. But let's at least be grateful for the heritage you and I have had the benefit of. David, thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. That's his confidence. He shall abide before God forever, O prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto the, thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. And... Uh, the word abide there, by the way, in the Hebrew actually means enthroned. And he, David, of course, had a covenant that his, di his dynasty would endure forever. That was the promise that was given to David in 2 Samuel 7. And that's the promise that was con confirmed to Mary in Luke 1. And uh, we'll, get, we'll encounter all that in, in Psalm 89 when we get there. But... Uh, Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. The closer you get to God, the more we realize our need for mercy. You know, it's very interesting uh, to, to, uh, to understand. If you go to Isaiah, let's just take a few verses from Isaiah 6. Isaiah speaks very interesting. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train, his skirt, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So the seraphims that he, Isaiah saw, some people think are the same as the cherubim, some say they're a little different, I won't go down that, it's not, it's peripheral to our interest here. But then Isaiah continues, and one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Notice there's three. It's one of the hints of the Trinity all through the Old Testament. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door, that is the thresholds of the door, moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So we, this is Isaiah getting a glimpse of the throne of God. Aren't you envious? Wouldn't that be something to actually behold? That's, that's what he's, he's getting a chance to see here. What is Isaiah's reaction with verse 5? Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. 
He realizes, he sees God, he realizes how unworthy he is to be there. And we could just concatenate all through the scripture. When people see God, they realize their shortcomings. And likewise, that was David's reaction here too. Well, let's move to Psalm 62, just to zip through these things. And if somebody says, this is the only psalm, what on earth? It's not the only psalm, but 150 of them. No, the word only, it's a Hebrew adverb. It truly, only, and alone is the same adverb. And so this psalm has the word only, in effect, in verse 1, verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 9. And so among, among uh, uh, scholars who have not better ways to spend their time, they call this the only psalm, because it has only so often, see. So you can use that as a little quiz with your Bible study group during the week. I know the only psalm, <laughs> Psalm 62. <laughs> and, uh, okay, to the chief musician, to Jedithan, a psalm of David. Psalm 39 was also written to Jedithan, one of the chief musicians. And apparently he um, led the orchestra to the choir when this psalm was, was uh, sung. Truly my soul, the word truly there is the same word, it means only. Truly my soul waiteth upon God, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, and I shall not be greatly moved. So defense or high place, okay? But there's, that's where the only echoes are starting here. How long will ye imagine mischief against man? He shall be slain of, he, ye shall be slain, all of you, as a bowing wall shall ye be, as a tottering fence. Then only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies, they bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon, there's only again, see, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge. Uh, and my refuge is in, is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. And by the way, the word surely there is the same word only again, by the way. Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that the power belongeth unto God. This once or twice is a Hebrew stylistic thing. It's a way of saying repeatedly. There's a number of those things you find in the Proverbs and elsewhere. It'll say six things that God hate. In fact, seven. It's, it's a stylistic thing. You say, well, you make up your mind. No, no, that's just a way they, it's, it's a form of emphasis, if you will. You know, six things God's hate. In fact, seven. Let me and he list seven things. Anyway, it's a similar type of structure, uh, grammatical structure here. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also, unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. For thou renderest to every man according to his work. And uh, boy, that's something that sounds a little New Testament, doesn't it? Thou renderest to every man according to his work. Is that Old Testament law? No, it's New Testament. 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. I'm enjoying a book by Joseph Dillow. You know, it's interesting, for 400 years, they've, the Calvinists and Arminians have argued, once saved, always saved, or you have to persevere to the end. There's a middle ground that is, in, appear, appears to me to be very, very scriptural. Once saved, always saved, that's bulletproof, Romans 8, you can go on and on and nail that one. But then why did Paul, who certainly is an expert on grace, live his life in, almost in paranoia, that he might miss the mark? He that perseveres to the end. He, what he's worried about is, inheritance. Being saved gives you entry into heaven, doesn't give you the rights to rearrange the furniture. Those that reign with him, you will reign with him, if so be that you persevere with him, that you're a partaker, a metakoi. 
And uh, so you begin to realize we don't talk a lot about rewards, but they're crucial. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be really upset when they're saved. They're going to get to heaven and discover, wow, did I miss the boat? They'll be crying. Their tears, God's going to wipe away their tears. Why are there tears in their eyes? Because they realize the opportunities they lost. You and I need to understand that our position throughout eternity is going to be a function of how effective a steward are we of, of the opportunities God brings us. You're not earning your salvation. Jesus paid for that. You're, I'm talking about people who are saved. If you're saved, you're saved. He did it all. And, try to add, and to try to add to that is blasphemy. On the other hand, he's called you to obedience. He's called you to stewardship. And he's going to reward. The first Corinthians 3 talks about it. The beam of sheep, you're going to be rewarded. Most people don't take that to heart and realize that's going to be a big deal. And I think a lot of people are going to be crushingly disappointed. That's where the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth come in. In so many of those parables that are a little confusing otherwise. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Wow. Well, anyway, let's move on to Psalm 63. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Here again, though, this is one where he's fleeing as a refuge. And, uh, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Is he thirsty? Absolutely. Is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. What is he thirsty for? God. It's a spiritual plea. That doesn't mean he wasn't also thirsty, but I don't think that's really this, that's, I don't think that's really his problem here. He had dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory as so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. By the way, that first line, O God, thou art my God. That possessive is it changes everything. Is he really your God? Or is he a God that you just heard about? Is he a God that you maybe learned a lot about? No. Is he really your God? Um, there's an interesting thing that occurs in Matthew 22 where um, they've been asking, the lawyers were asking Christ's question. He, 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 he turned to them and said, uh, let, me, let me ask you a question. Uh, David, uh, whose uh, who's son is he? Uh, or, uh, the Messiah, whose son is he? He's the son of David. Right, it's okay. Then how can David, and he quotes Psalm 110, how can David say, my Lord? And he, how can he be David's Lord and be the son of David? And they couldn't answer that. And his whole, and, it's a, and from that point on, they didn't ask him any more questions. The whole thing hangs on a yod, which is a little like an apostrophe. The word Adonai with a yod makes it possessive. How can David say, my Lord, if he's David's son? They, they couldn't handle that. And I think you know, that, that, it's interesting. You know, Jesus said, not one yod or one tittle shall pass on the law till all be fulfilled. And here's a case with that yod. Won the argument. They, they were to put him to totally, totally confused. Well, here again we have, oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because of love, thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. That's quite a statement. Thy loving kindness is better than life itself, to have God's enduring mercy. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Many of you sing this as a chorus. We used to sing it at Calvary all the time, right? My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. And they did have night watches. That from sunset to ten, and from ten till two, and from two to sunrise. So that's, he may be referring to military watches or just in a restless night, whichever. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. There's that idiom again. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. There's his right hand again. I think that's interesting. 
But those that seek my soul to destroy it, it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. Hmm. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. David's asking God to deal with his enemies. And he did, by the way. 2 Samuel 18, verses 6 through 8, deals with that. He asked for it, and he got it. Okay, one more. Psalm 64. This is a, quite a psalm. It deals with the battle of life itself. The battle of life itself. Napoleon had an interesting, there's an interesting quote here that came across from Napoleon. The first quality for a commander-in-chief is a cool head to receive a correct impression of things. He should not allow himself to be confused by either good or bad news. The same thing is said in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Chronicles 12.32. To be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel had to do. It's this kind of attitude that motivates our uh, activities within the Koine Institute to monitor the strate their strategic horizon, strategic trends, to try to understand, not the propaganda, not the, thing, not the party line, not the, uh, the uh, deliberate shaping of opinions by the media, no, no, find out what's really going on. And Napoleon summarized the same thing, you know, uh, uh, first quality for a commander-in-chief is a cool head to receive a correct impression of things, a valid strategic perspective, I would add. He should not allow himself to be confused by either good or bad news. So let's take a look at this. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection of the workers of iniquity, who wet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, Ooh. that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. Suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privately. They say, who shall see them? They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. Both the inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. These are bad apples. You know any of those? This, is, this, this whole behavior lines up with Satan's strategies. See, as a lion, he comes to devour, right? 1 Peter 5, 8, right? As a serpent, he comes to deceive. That's his basic schema, isn't it? 2 Corinthians 11, first four verses. Accusation is a chief weapon of him. I'm always fascinated with these radio personalities that their basic marketing strategy is to, is to accuse the brethren. They spend all their time on the air attacking other Christians with whom they have a difference of opinion. That's called accusing the brethren. I know where that comes from. There's a procedure if you have a difference of view. The first thing you do is to talk to the person about it. But going around in public display and and calling people you disagree with, heretics and all that, is serving the enemy, not serving the cause of Christ. And some of these guys are self-defeating because they, their arrogance is their primary badge. And uh, when they die, wisdom will die with them, you would seem, right? Now, David compared the enemy's activities here, that he compared their tongues with swords, and he compared their words with poisoned arrows. He did that in the previous psalm, he's doing it here again. But he continues, but God shall shoot at them with an arrow, and suddenly they shall be wounded. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves, all that see them shall flee away. You know, it's interesting how often God uses their own stratagems against them. The traps they set for somebody else, they fall into. 
remind you of Haman with his so-called gallows and Esther for Mordecai. Who, who was the first to hang on Haman's gallows? Haman was. And then his ten sons also. It wasn't a gallow, by the way. It was, a, it was a, in, impaled on a, on a cross. But that's a translational issue. Anyway, they, they, they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. All the men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in him. And all the upright in heart shall glory. Are you upright in heart? Then you're going to share his glory. Okay. Let's take another, a lot of these little ones, so that we'll knock them off here. This is the first of four psalms that focus on praising the Lord for his manifold blessings in nature and his gracious dealing with his people. Two themes will be woven here. His blessings in the creation itself and his particularly graciousness in dealing with his people. Psalm 65 is the first of four that do this. To the chief musician, a psalm in the Song of David, he begins, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. You know, that's interesting. That's millennial. That's going to happen in the millennium. There's going to be a temple in Israel that all flesh will go there. Gentiles too. Many people don't recognize. Had a workman come to the house and he happened to notice that we have a masusa on the front door. He says, what is that? I see that around. What is that? It's a Jewish thing, isn't it? I said, yes. That's what you, in any Jewish home you'll find that. Are you Jewish? No, we're not Jewish, but the God we worship is. I want him to be welcome here. <laughs> he did not deal with that, you know. Christ is Jewish. If he's going to come here, I want him to feel comfortable. You know, there's a mezuzah. You know. I don't think he's Talmudic, but that's okay. All right. All flesh, unto thee shall all flesh come. That's a prophecy. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgressions. Thou shalt purge them away. Praise God for that. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and cause us to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Wow, there's a, this is a theologically provocative verse. Because here's a person that God chooses that will d dwell in his courts and in God's house. Now, it implies, this raises sort of the question that comes up when you study Revelation. When you find this peculiar group of people that are kings and priests. In Israel, they weren't kings and priests. The kings were of the tribe of Judah. And the priests were of the tribe of Levi. And they were not to cross. The king could not go in the, t t the tabernacle or in the temple. And the Levites really weren't in the, in the court either. So in, but here, this is talking about something that, again, I think, I see it uh, dispensationally provocative because it's talking about Revelation 5 and following. Anyway, David continues, By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea. As an enabled came guy, I like that, verse 5, you know. Okay. Which by his strength setteth fast the mountains being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas and the noise of their waves and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the spring thereof. This is giving God credit for everything that we have, in effect. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. The word crown of the, crown of the year, Rosh Hashanah is the chief of the year, the, for New Year. Some scholars think that this is an allusion, in effect, to the beginning of the year in the fall, for a lot of different reasons, but that is one of the, the, crown, the, the, the crown of the year suggests Rosh Hashanah. But anyway, uh, I'll cross the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness. 
They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. That's kind of neat. Little praise song. Let's go to Psalm 66, okay? To the chief musician, a song or psalm. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say unto God, how terrible, or awesome might be a better term, how awesome art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Selah. Are they doing that yet? I don't think so. <laughs> That's yet coming. That's millennial, if you will. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome. It says terrible here, but I think awesome is perhaps a better translation. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. He ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves, Selah. Wow. Oh, bless our God, ye people. Make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O God, hast provided, proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidst affliction upon our loins. Thou caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. How quick we are to promise things when we're in trouble, huh? Yep. Yeah. They were saying, he's going to make it good. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings. With the incense of rams, I will offer bullocks with goats, Selah. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Precious, precious verses. Now, where is the Christian's bar of soap? Remember 1 John 1, 9. says the same thing from the New Testament perspective. If we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's his faithfulness that we count on, not ours, his. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to, to forgive my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9, that's the Christian's bar of soap. But we'll move on here. Psalm 67. Now this brief psalm also mentions all nations, so it fits with the previous two, 65 and 66. To the chief musician on the Niganoth, that's a stringed instrument, a uh, psalm or song. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Well, that's a, that, that echoes the famous Old Testament benediction, number 6, verses 24. The Lord bless thee and keep thee, Lord, to make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Lord, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So number 6, 24 to 26, it has that echo. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. That thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. See, this is not Israel. This is everybody. Interesting. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations, there again, it's Gentile. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. Has that happened yet? Not so you notice. No, that's yet coming. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Nice little psalm there. Well, we've got another one last one to wrap it up here. Now, in order to prepare for Psalm 68, 
we're going to read briefly, to skim through, the song of Deborah. In Judges chapter 5, there's a song of victory uh, with, by, the, by Deborah, who uh, thanks God for the incredible success they've had. So this is from Judges chapter 5, the song of Deborah. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, that's Edom in effect, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, and the clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anoth, in the days of Yael, the highways were unoccupied. The travelers walked through the byways. The inhabitants of the village ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates, and there was a shield or spear seen among the 40,000 in Israel. My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless, bless ye the Lord. Not everybody did, by the way. She's going to compliment the ones that helped and, and talk about the ones that didn't. Speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. They that are delivered from the noise of the archers and the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou sin, son of Abinoam. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim there was a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Machir came down the governors. And out of Zebulun they that handled the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben there were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. They were apparently a little timid, thinking about it. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? This is a strange remark. Deborah is complimenting the people that helped, but she's kind of um, frustrated with a couple of them here, Dan and Asher. We'll see you here in a minute. Um, Dan in ships. Dan was assigned when the, in, in the book of Joshua, when they drew lots, Dan received the land that was west of Benjamin, which included the Philistines, and um, they couldn't handle it. Uh, Samson came along during the day of the judges and did a lot of colorful pranks, but didn't really accomplish much. And when he died, they couldn't deal with it. So the tribe of Dan sent a a team up north and found a place up way in the northern end called Laish, took it over and moved up there. So they didn't stay where they were assigned, they went up north. What makes this so strange is when you get to Deuteronomy 32 and Mo, uh, Moses is, you have a song of Moses there where he's prophesying over each of the 12 tribes. When he gets to the tribe of Dan, he says, he will leap from Bashan. Well, that's pretty weird because Bashan is up north. That wasn't where they were assigned. And all this happened long after Moses' prophecy. But he apparently prophesied they would leap from Bashan. Where did they leap to? They apparently made, they made um, friends with the um, Phoenicians, became seafaring, and went ahead and populated that area we call Europe. And many people are, there's all these strange legends that most people associate with the Ten Lost, the ten lost Tribes, which is nonsense. That's not Ten Lost Tribes. But the tribe of Dan did peel off and uh, 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 pursue a future separate from the commonwealth of Israel. It's interesting here, though, in, in the Song of Deborah, why did Dan remain in his ships? That's, you know, she's wondering, you know, he didn't, he didn't help this victory. And then she continues, Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. So Asher didn't help much either. She goes on, the Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. 
So they, they were part of the action here. They're getting complimented. But it's interesting. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in the ships? That's a, there's a whole thing you can get into there. Moving on. The kings came and fought, and then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh, in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, and they took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. They, then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the pausings, pr prancings and the prancings of their mighty ones. Curse ye, Meraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above women shall Yale, the wife of Heber, and Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked, he asked water, and she gave milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer, and with the hammer she smote Sisera, drove it right through him, by the way, and smote off his head. And when she had pierced and stricken through his temples, she played rough, yeah. And her feet were bowed. She, he fell, lay down at her feet. He bowed and he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. I guess with a nail through his temples, I guess he would be. Yeah. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, Yea, she returned answer to herself, Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man, a damsel or two? Uh, to Sisera, a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, a divers colors of needlework on both sides. Meet for the necks of them that take spoil. So let them. All the enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as a son when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. Song of Deborah. Okay. Little review. If you, the whole background, of course, is in the book of Judges. Incredible victory. Widely celebrated. Lots of little clues. Let's get at Psalm 68, which will conclude our evening. To the chief musician, a psalm or song of David. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad, and let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the fatherless, a judge of the widows, is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families, he bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, Selah. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. The Lord gave the word, great was the company of those that published it. Kings of armies did flee apace, and she that tarried at home divided the spoil. Though ye have lean among the pots, yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. When the Almighty scattereth kings in it, it was white as snow in Solomon. The word Solomon means dark, by way, shady, dark, and so forth. It's actually a hill near Shechem on which Abimelech cut down the boughs with which they set to fire the, 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 to fire the tower of Shechem. And uh, so the, uh, uh, it, it's, it's just a, the snow and, and Salmon, it's just a contrast of snow with darkness. The hill of God is as the hill of Bashan. Now Bashan is up what we call the Gol Golan Heights probably. And high hill as the hill of Bashan. So this is east of the Jordan, it's the high ground up there. Why leap ye high hills? This is the hill which God desireth to dwell in, yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Blessed be the Lord 
who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, Selah. He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. But God shall wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp of such a one as goeth on still in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my king in the sanctuary. There's, a, again, this interesting contradiction that you've got to be alert to. The king and yet in the sanctuary, that's interesting. The singers went before, the players on instruments followed after. Among them were the damsels playing on timbrels. Bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin with their ruler, the princes of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us. Interesting lineup. The same lineup as in the Song of Deborah, by the way. Interesting. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of bulls with the calves of the people, till every one submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. There are about two dozen verses that imply that Ethiopia has a very special gift, gift for the Messiah when he rules in Zion. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praises unto the Lord. Selah. To him that rideth upon the heavens of the heavens... Which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. Well, I can imagine. Ascribe ye strength unto God, his excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible out of thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. Whew. Okay. So there's a handful. We've covered quite a few. The parallels between uh, the Song of Deborah and uh, that particular psalm is, I think, provocative. Psalm 68 and the Song of Deborah. So you can look at them and come to your own perceptions. So for the next session, you might just take a look at the next 10, 69 through 79. We'll see how far we get in the next sessions. But uh, as we go through, we are um, at essentially uh, the halfway point. Uh, probably more than that because we've covered so much basics as we've gone. But uh, we're going to get into some very, very unusual psalms forthcoming. So you want to skim through and, and uh, don't read them just once. Read them several times to see if you can get the heart of what it is because it's a devotional exercise, not an intellectual one. And so with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer.